Well, my name is Tim Payton. I'm a director of Rubicon Cinema. Thank you, everyone, for uh, coming out for our uh, special Halloween Rubicon virtual reading. Uh, this is our second virtual reading with William and Derek. And this is actually our third event with William in regards to this trilogy of novels. Um, before we get started, though, I just want to tell you a little bit about Rubicon Cinema, because I recognize um, a number of you are not from Northeast Ohio. Um, so we're an ongoing screening series um, hosted in Akron, Ohio, that focuses primarily on experimental cinema, um, nonfiction, animation, outer limits type stuff. Um, we have uh, filmmaker guests from all over the globe at this point. Um, we're heading into our, we're, we're in our seventh season right now. Um, I'd like to thank all of our Rubicon fans also who are uh, logging in and um, very supportive and excited about Rubicon events. Um, if you're not in the area and you'd like to know more about what we're doing, what we're up to, uh, please follow us on our Instagram and Facebook. And um, you could you can contact me through one of those channels if you'd like to be included on our email list. Um, and just a quick plug for our next Rubicon event. Um, it's actually going to be on a Saturday after Thanksgiving, November 25th. And uh, but we're going to have with us a very cool filmmaker. His name his name is Jim Finn. Um, and he's going to be in town to show his new film called The Apocalyptic is the Mother of All Christians. Christian theology. And uh, Jim is a really interesting filmmaker who works in realms of experimental and documentary filmmaking. Uh, this one is about the life and work inspired by Paul the Apostle. And uh, he does this through all sorts of found footage of Christian propaganda material and also using actors and reenactments. Um, so he's going to be here with us Saturday, November 25th. Uh, so keep an eye out on uh, more information about that soon. Um, well, we're very excited to have with us William and Derek. Um, just I'm going to just give very brief introductions. I'm going to hand it over to William, uh, who's going to start off the evening. Um, William e. Jones is an artist, filmmaker, and writer, uh, known for films like Maslin, Finished, Tea Room, and Fall into Ruin, and nonfiction books such as Hostead Plays Himself, and true homosexual experience. Tonight, William will be reading from his latest novel, I Didn't See It Coming, which is the third part of his trilogy, beginning with, I'm open to anything, and I should have known better. William is also a visual artist who is represented by the Kordansky Gallery. Derek McCormick is a very interesting writer based out of Toronto. It's a, really it's a really great pleasure to have him here again with us. His work is kind of indescribable in a way. Um, Derek's most recent novel, Castle Faggot, was highly acclaimed from a couple years ago. And since then, he has published a collection of essays titled Judy Blame's Obituary, Writings on Fashion and Death. Um, tonight, Derek is going to be reading, um, he's going to be reading parts of what I understand is a, a zine that he wrote years back that it's kind of um, a small publication, um, very special reading. Uh, he's gonna, we're gonna show uh, images of the scene as well. Um, so with that, I'm gonna hand it over to William. Thank you, everyone. Hello. Um, so I am gonna be reading from my third novel. And uh, here it is on screen. I didn't see it coming. And uh, you can order it from the website of the publisher, We Heard You Like Books in Los Angeles. Or you can get it from the evil conglomerate Amazon. Uh, and possibly order it through your local bookstore. Although uh, my success with being part of the stock of independent bookstores has not been brilliant uh, for reasons we can discuss a little later. Anyway, uh, I'll be reading the beginning of this novel. And um, I must apologize in advance that Derek is much more in the spirit of the holiday than I am. 
He will be reading something that is about Halloween. Uh, and I will just be reading something that's a little bit scary. Um, depending on your sensibilities, I don't know if it's really scary or not, but we'll we'll see. Um, my reading will be less than 10 minutes, and then uh, we will have Derek's reading and then some questions, which uh, I hope will come to us via chat. Uh, and there's the chat icon at the bottom of your screen, which you can use if you'd like to ask a question. Um, so anyway, <clears throat> here it is, the beginning of my third novel. As I lay in bed one night, I got a telephone call from my friend Daniel. I hadn't seen him in years. He told me how much he missed me and proposed we get together. We arranged to meet that coming Sunday. On the day, I ate a late breakfast, trimmed and filed my nails, and packed a small bag. I wasn't sure if Daniel's visit would entail travel, so I prepared myself for any eventuality short of kidnapping. Daniel arrived a few minutes before 11 a.m. He had trouble parking his enormous pickup truck on my narrow street, so he blew his horn. I looked out and he motioned for me to join him. I grabbed my bag and left. When I climbed into the passenger seat, I kissed him and asked, where are we going? He turned onto the northbound Hollywood freeway and said, Santa Clarita. As we drove through the traffic snarls where freeways merged, Daniel talked about what he had been doing. He had started a company with his boyfriend, John, but it was Daniel who did all the work. I want to leave that guy sometimes, he said, but I don't want to lose the house. As Daniel's truck started to, to ascend the grade before the Santa Clarita Valley, the entire system of roads narrowed to a single freeway going over a mountain pass. I looked to my right and saw the Los Angeles Aqueduct Cascades, the end of the pipes that carried water 200 miles from the Owens Valley to the San Fernando Valley. Normally dry, the artificial waterfall was in full flow at that moment to spectacular effect. On this spot in 1913, as the water that made Los Angeles's urban growth possible rushed down the slope for the first time, the project's chief engineer, William Mulholland, proclaimed, there it is, take it. We exited the freeway at Magic Mountain Parkway and ended up at a building in an industrial park, park off Rye Canyon Road. As intense sun beat down on the parking lot, I remembered the extreme summer heat in the area. I was glad I no longer lived anywhere near there. Daniel unlocked the door to an office and turned on the lights and air conditioning. The entryway was cramped and bright, cluttered with paperwork and boxes of products about to be shipped. Beyond it was a large dark room, also cluttered, intended for storage and in a couple of open areas for assembling products. Less sympathetic souls would have called the place a sweatshop. Daniel had set up a bed in the inner room and beside it a table with all the supplies he needed. Poppers, tit clamps, his own special mixture of lube, and a baby bottle full of a combination of vodka and fruit punch. He turned on loud techno music so the neighbors wouldn't hear what we were about to do. He stripped off his clothes and got on all fours. He put plugs in his ears and blindfolded himself. Just, be put a, just before he put a ball gag in his mouth, he said, I'm ready. Pretend you're fisting Helen Keller. He stuck his ass in the air. As my eyes got accustomed to the darkness, I spread lube on my hand and forearm and looked around. The business, Danielle's Crypt, manufactured horror-themed novelties. To my left, I saw a box labeled Small Plastic Skulls, color fluorescent green. To my right, there were refrigerator magnets made from tiny portraits of famous serial killers. Behind me, I noticed a jar containing fetal twins conjoined at the head and suspended in translucent liquid. I assumed that this was a sample of the sort of object the company could produce on demand for clients, but I wasn't entirely sure. 
If anyone would have had a pickled medical specimen in his workplace, it was Daniel. I laughed loudly enough for him to hear. He stirred from his position and asked, what's so funny? Oh, nothing. This must be the most peculiar place I've ever had sex. I doubt it, he said, then replaced the gag in his mouth. <clears throat> I decided to be gentle with Daniel. I felt his asshole carefully and finger by finger got my hand inside his rectum. There was little resistance. I gradually made my way inside him until I was elbow deep in his ass. At that point, my hand felt a tight bend. I delicately worked it open. My progress was only a tiny fraction of an inch every few minutes. Then suddenly his colon opened up dramatically. I was able to make a fist and move it back and forth. I heard a muffled scream and Daniel raised one hand our usual signal for me to stop, so I began to pull out. I did this as slowly as I could, feeling each band of sphincter muscles caressing my fingers. He broke out in a cold sweat and began to tremble, but I continued at the same pace until my hand emerged little by little from his ass. When I was finished, he rose to a kneeling position, took off his gag and kissed me. He said, I love you then returned to his prone position before I could respond. After a few more plunges nearly elbow deep, I lubed up my other forearm and tried to fit both hands inside his ass. While one hand was fully inserted, I would place the other hand on top of my arm and slip it inside with the thinnest part of my wrist. By the end of the session, I was able to insert both hands completely. He screamed into his pillow. His screams and the pink blood that had started to appear on my hands concerned me, so I stopped. I wiped off the lube and collapsed on the bed in next to him. He began to fondle me with slight grazing motions, and I soon had an erection. He swallowed my entire cock as his eyes watered. When I was about to come, he gave his, I gave his sweaty face an affectionate slap. He, he took a deep breath and let me ejaculate down his throat. He lay down next to me and we dozed off briefly. I woke up first and went to the bathroom to scrub my arms. We had lunch at a sushi restaurant around the corner. Daniel ate with messy abandon, stuffing himself to break what must have been a 12 hour fast. With a mouthful of food, he said, that was the best session since the first time you fisted me. We have to do this more often. Maybe at my place. That way you'll only be driving 40 miles rather than 100. He said, I'd drive a 1,000 for your fist. I smiled and asked, are you feeling well enough to take me home? I don't know. You might have to drive my truck back to your place. That giant thing? I'll try. After we paid the check, I did my best to negotiate the freeways on the route home. Fortunately, there was little traffic. Daniel quickly dozed off in the passenger seat and was asleep when I reached my street. I parked the truck on the only space on the block large enough to accommodate it. As he woke up, he asked, is it okay if I come in and rest before I drive home? Of course. Once inside my apartment, he immediately took off his clothes and headed for the shower. I tidied up the bedroom a bit and turned back the covers. He staggered in dripping wet and sat down on the bed. I wiped off his back. He had gained weight since I had last seen him. He looked like a big bald homeboy approaching middle age. We took a nap that lasted until dinner time. Not wanting to repark the truck, I suggested we walk down the hill to my favorite neighborhood restaurant for a light dinner. Daniel made fun of the Peruvian food saying it reminded him of a meal on Pee Wee's Playhouse. I said, hey, it's not like my experiences with Salvadoran cuisine have been that exciting. He grunted. I don't like it too much either, but I grew up with it. I think Salvadoran food is too bland. He laughed. You've been trained by those fanatics in northern Mexico to eat super spicy food. I can't handle it. I shrugged. I've gotten addicted to chili peppers. He said you'd reconsider if you had the bottom. A few hours later, it's fucking painful. Daniel spent the night. I couldn't tell if he felt too groggy to drive home. 
if he wanted to punish his boyfriend for something, or if he considered this a rehearsal for a new domestic arrangement with me. He slept soundly, snoring while I slept fitfully. I wasn't accustomed to sharing my bed. And that's the beginning of the first chapter of I Didn't See It Coming. There it is again. All right, Derek, it's your turn. William, I can't remember. Did I, did you ever uh, think about calling the book Fisting Helen Keller? <laughs> is that something that you talked about? That's the nickname I give to the first half of the, the chapter. The, you know, when someone asks me, what are you going to read at the event? I say, Fisting Helen Keller. Right, 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 right. Um, I, I, I know we. I had heard that phrase. I'd read it, and then I'd heard you utter it. So, uh, I just want. I was. I just wanted to double check. I mean, I think as a title, it would be a complete anticlimax because the title is explained within the first few pages. <laughs> I know, but it, it, uh, it's just when you said that line, I roared here. I, I'm glad I was muted and had the camera off. I'm glad my humor has reached Toronto. <laughs> All right, it's your turn. Okay. Thank you. Uh, hey, I'm going to read for the next three hours. That's not true. I have to be in bed by nine. So I'm going to read briefly, but I might read a bit longer than William. Um, I'm reading from Hams, uh, which is a short for the Halloween Arts Mail Order School. I'm going to explain it a bit. Um, over 10 years ago, closer to 14 years ago, uh, my friend, the artist Ian Phillips and I started a mail art project, uh, which uh, was sponsored uh, by the Art Gallery at York University here in Toronto. And this is, was it, Hams. Uh, uh, it was uh, set up like a classic mail order school at the turn of the 20th century. Um, people would write in to enroll, they would then get uh, an introductory letter, then a series of lessons. Each lesson had a task for them to complete, a project, uh, which they would mail back to us, which we would grade. And after it was all over, they received a yearbook. Uh, images of all these things are going to uh, flash by uh, as I talk. This, for example, is lesson one that they received. What's the next slide, can I ask, Tim? Ah, uh, there. That's that was the yearbook that was published. So, uh, the premise uh, that was the setup. The premise was that uh, I, Derek McCormick, was a uh, Halloweenologist in Peterborough, Ontario, which is my hometown, and I was teaching a class in 1936, 1937. So, in fact, when you enrolled in the school, you went back in time um, and uh, learned about Halloween as I saw it in 1936, 1937. The uh, focus of the school was to teach Halloween lore and how to have a Halloween. Uh, the subtext was that I was this lonely fag. I guess, <laughs> I guess that's not a subtext. That's the text of my life. Uh, but that my mother had died of cancer uh, and I was writing out of grief for her. Um, we pretty much got the project done. Um, that's the inside of the yearbook. Um, unfortunately, I got cancer and I had to wrap it up very fast. And Ian Phillips, uh, my great friend, um, managed to finish it, uh, distribute the yearbooks, uh, create objects that we sold as merchandise. You're going to see images from the yearbook. You're going to see ads from the yearbook that Ian created. And I'm going to read a bit and see how long this goes. Uh, this uh, was the letter you received when you enrolled, the introduction letter. Um, it says, Introduction to Halloween Arts, 1936-1937. And this is the text. The devil, he's red, he's horned, he's a dime. It's Halloween in Woolworths. The devil is a jack-o'-lantern. The seasonal aisle is stocked with jack-o'-lanterns. Pumpkin-shaped lanterns painted pumpkin. Bats and black cats made of composition or cardboard. They're grotesque not nearly as grotesque as my mother. The way she looked the day she died, two teeth in her head, lips so thin she was lipless, bald as a bald wig. The glow, 
She was glowing green in her hospital room. My mother, jack-o'-lantern. My mother, miasma. When is a jack-o'-lantern a clock? When it's a jack-o'-lantern, a model manufactured by the West Clocks Clock Company since 1922. The jack-o'-lantern is a wind-up alarm clock. The face is paperboard, the casing nickel plated tin. It looks nothing like a jack-o'-lantern save for in this regard, it glows in the dark. My mother made me mine. A jack-o'-lantern is a Halloween decoration. It has eyes, a nose, a mouth. A jack-o'-lantern clock has hands printed on its face, made in Canada. A jack-o'-lantern is lit with a candle, a jack-o'-lantern clock with radium. The jack-o'-lantern clock was the first radio lum luminescent clock made in Canada. In 1922, radium was a novelty. In 1922, my mother was working at the West Clocks plant in my hometown of Peterborough. She'd been assembling Big Ben's. She switched to painting jack-o'-lanterns with radium paint. The radium was refined in a town near Peterborough in Port Hope. Second minute hour, my mother painted jack-o'-lantern hands and dials, notches marking minutes, numerals marking hours. West Clocks kept the workroom dark she and other painters worked by the glow of paint pots. The painters were all women. West Clocks had a hit. Stores like Simpsons and Eaton sold the jack-o'-lantern clock. My mother painted 350 dials a day, dipping her brush in radium paint, drawing it across dials, then reshaping it with her lips, tipping the brush, the technique's called. The paint contained linseed oil. Oil made it easier to apply. It also contained pear oil. It tasted pleasant. That's the application form uh, to the school. In 1923, West Clocks held a Halloween party for the press to crow about the success of the jack-o'-lantern clock. The Peterborough Examiner was there, so too was TikTok, a newsletter put out by West Clocks employees. Mother and a few lady friends dressed up as pumpkins. TikTok took a picture, then turned the lights off. Mother and the others glowed. They'd painted their costumes with jack-o'-lantern faces, triangle eyes, triangle noses, gap tooth grins. They daubed radium paint on their lips and eyelids too, for fun. Fingernails glowed like doorbells. Hours, the doctor said. My mother said nothing. How could she? The doctor had surgically removed a section of her jaw. He held up the bit of bone he'd biopsied. It had a hundred holes in it. It was honeycombed. My mother had painted jack-o'-lanterns for five years. The radium, the doctor said, had buried itself in her bones, then burned outward. He said he'd seen a couple of other cases of honeycomb bone. He said all of them in women, West Clocks women. Radium disease, the doctor said. Radium sickness, radium necrosis. It was 1927. He said there was no scientific term for what my mother had. The illness was new. It was not yet named. I know a name. Jack-o'-lanternitis. The doctor did know this. There was no cure. Bury her in a lead-lined casket, he said. Do not embalm her, he said. Do not kiss her. Time of death. He drew a sheet over her head, her jaw glowing beneath bandages. Lantern jawed. Black cats bristling, black cats on brooms. The seasonal aisle is stocked for Halloween, cutouts and die cuts, die cuts of my mother. This is what Woolworths should sell. I'm in Woolworths. Count Dracula's cape is cotton, fangs are wax candy, teeth taste good. A wig that makes a man into a werewolf, it has human hair. Mother is the costume the store should sell. A hospital gown, a wig missing half its hair a gauze mask stiffened with sweat. Mother was more macabre than any decoration, more monstrous than any movie monster, more luminous than any jack-o'-lantern. Why not sell mother-o'-lanterns? Skulls shaped like my mother's skull, glowing in the dark from the inside out, gangrenous green, composition, decomposition. Trick, talk, trick, talk, the sound of a Halloween clock. I'm in Woolworths. The clock aisle is stocked with jack-o'-lanterns. West Clock still makes them. 
Clock painters these days wear gloves and masks and aprons, iron aprons. Radium, it turns clocks into Halloween decoration. It turned my mother into a Halloween decoration. The clock she painted still glow. Is her ghost in the clocks? Are the clocks her ghosts? Is the devil radium? With a jack-o'-lantern clock, it's always Halloween, or as I've come to call it, Mother's Day. Uh, I'm gonna read a bit from, uh, oh, those are penance uh, from hands that were available for order for students of the school. Um, I'm gonna read a bit from uh, lesson five, which was the final lesson that students received. Um, I'm gonna abbreviate it a bit just so you get a taste of uh, uh, the history bits of the lessons and then the assignments at the end. Ding dong, that's what my doorbell says. My house, on the other hand, ticks. It tick tocks. I have clocks in every room. Tick tock, tick tock. I have six clocks in every room, sometimes seven. At Halloween, I put one on the porch. Why wouldn't I? It's a jack o' lantern. All my clocks are jack o' lanterns. The jack o' lantern is an alarm clock manufactured by West Clock. My mother worked at West Clock. She made jack o' lanterns. She painted hands with undark. Undark is radium paint. My mother painted the jack-o'-lantern that sat beside her bed. She painted the one that sits beside my bed. After she died, I bought up all the ones at Woolworths. She painted them too. She painted hundreds of hands. Radium made her fingers glow. It made her lips glow. It sank into her skeleton. She died. The clocks run like clockwork. Halloween is the devil's holiday. The night when he brings bogeys back from beyond the grave to play pranks on people. So say the superstitious. The unsuperstitious? It's the night when the mischief makers among them dress up like bogies, then haunt and hound friends and foes. The devil has a rule. Bogies glow and things that glow are bogies. Bogies must glow. How else would folks see them and feel afraid? To become bogies, the living must glow too. Before radium was discovered, the living became bogies by carrying around jack-o'-lanterns. They played pranks with them, played games with them, incorporated them into costumes. They haunted their streets and towns. When their jack-o'-lanterns burned out, the mischief makers did the only thing they could. They went indoors and decorated. The devil haunts every house. In every house there is illness, in many houses there is death. Most houses stand on grounds where something died, men, women, animals. Why aren't all houses haunted? Because it takes more than ghosts to make a haunted house. A house must also look the part. It must be terrifying. It must be dressed in hauntedness. In 1893, Chicago hosted the Columbia World Exposition. Hundreds of thousands went to it. Zanzik went to it too. Zanzik was a struggling stage musician from New York. He hated that spiritualists made so much money with simplistic tricks, noises in the dark, levitating tables, etc. So he became a spiritualist. He rented a house on the north side of Chicago and tricked it out. He built a seance room that contained the gimmickry of a magician's stage. A trapdoor in the floor led to a full-fledged workshop that could produce noises, ghosts, anything. He and some magician friends made a mint, for a time at least. They were stopped by a client, an elderly German man, who asked to see the spirit of his dead wife. Zanzik produced her, or a simulation of her, a girl draped in gauze. The elderly man took a heart attack and died. When the police came, they discovered the scam and shut it down. No charges were pressed. The police took payoffs. In Chicago in 1893, Zanzik wasn't the only aunt haunted house. On the south side of town, H.H. H. Holmes had built himself a hotel. It occupied a corner lot in a residential neighborhood. He leased the first floor to a jeweler. He rented the upstairs rooms to, women's working at the, to women working at the Columbian Exposition. There were three floors, not including the basement, which was also a dungeon. The women were lost as soon as they stepped in. The halls upstairs winding and dark, some were dead ends. The rooms could be locked from the outside. 
The rooms contained secret passageways and walls that opened like doors. Trap doors led to slides that carried them down to the basement. Holmes, it said, murdered as many as 200 women in the hotel. He burned their bodies in a furnace in the basement or disposed of them in a barrel of lye. After Holmes was hung for murder, the city of Chicago burned his house to the ground. The press published photos of the house before and after the fire. The press published blueprints of the house. People built their own horror houses from the blueprints, not people, carnies. And then I talk about Coney Island a bit and the history of carnal, carnival haunted houses. Haunted houses started out as amusement park attractions, but soon became staples of Halloween. The Denison Manufacturing Company did big business selling Halloween decorations. In its annual Halloween decorating guide, the Bogey Book, it taught customers how to make pirate caves and dungeons from crepe paper. In its Halloween fun book of 24, the Minnesota Halloween Committee recommended a trail of terror as an apt way to start a home party. A dark hall could be decorated with old fur or strips of raw liver. A staircase could be waxed to the point of slipperiness. Young boys, the book said, are especially fascinated by the trail of terror. It fulfills a deep-seated longing for adventure and excitement on Halloween and gives the boy thrilling memory for months to come. Modern Mechanics magazine went further, publishing blueprints for such a walk through dark ride in home. Stairs could be rigged to squeal when stepped on. A jerry-built walkway could come close to collapsing when walked on. A garbage can could explode when walked on. Moo cans, they were called. I don't need moo cans, for I had mother. Radioactive rays ate away at her jawbone. When she died, it was honeycombed. It was a bone by Beisel. Beisel is a famous Halloween ornament maker. You'll have seen them when you open them out, uh, tissue paper becomes honeycomb. Craft instructions. Why stop at a house? Why not haunt a whole town? You could sneak into a stationery store, find all the wall calendars, and pull out all the pages for November and December. It's Halloween forever. You could climb into a clock tower, paint the word jack-o'-lantern across the clock's face, take an iron pipe to whichever moving parts you can reach, make the clock stop. It's Halloween o'clock. You could sneak into a hospital, pour radium paint into the plasma, you could sneak into a school, pour radium paint into the milk bottles. You could sneak into a funeral parlor, pour radium paint into embalming fluid. You could pour radium paint into a water tower, pour radium paint into a lake or river, pour it into a well, pour radium paint over a farmer's field. In 1914, a farmer in Wisconsin fertilized his crops with radium-dosed water. He found that carrots grew the same as they ever had. He found that squash and turnips grew 20% bigger. He found that pumpkins grew a full 40% larger than they ever had before in his fields. Radium produces mutant pumpkins. They are edible, though eating them will give you heartburn, and then probably tumors. Here is the fifth and final assignment for students of the Holiday Arts Mail Order School. Send me back my mother. Okay, I'm going to end it there. Thank you. That's the first time I've ever read from it. And uh, it was nice to do it here. Thank you. All right, Tim, do you have any questions for us? I have a lot of questions for you guys. But first of all, thank you. That was, that was great. Both of you. Um, well, where to begin, actually? Um, so wait, Derek, you said that's the first time you've you've read from that? Yeah, yeah. I, I worked on it for years with Ian, and we um we had quite a number of students, maybe 70, I think. Um, people dropped out as they got a craft assignments. Uh, but at one point in 2011, we built a haunted house at the art fair in Toronto, and then we uh, then I got sick. Um, so the book, it was supposed to be much, it was supposed to be longer. Uh, I got cancer having written about cancer and then having gotten cancer, my mother got cancer and died. And so Ian finished the book by himself, but, um, uh, all of which made it 
slightly nauseating for me to read today, but I figure I've nauseated people with my writing for years, so it's only fair that I felt a little nauseated. Well, all the secret passageways, rooms, buildings, history, just was making me think a lot of your recent, your recent novels. Oh, it's true. It's very Castle Faggot. I mean, yeah. I would say I'm a one note writer, but I don't think it's a whole note. You know, like uh, I, I do the same thing over and over. I just like plunking on the piano and slightly at a key, but uh, I keep making new pieces out of it. So uh, and very different, but like, uh, yeah, it takes you deeper down into this, this place. Yeah, and it's circling the same drain but it's uh, at different speeds. And um, fortunately, I, I mean, the, the one thing I do right is I write really short things so people can't get super sick of them. And then it takes me years to write them. So it's not like people have a flood of me to deal with. It trickles in. And maybe in that time, they forget that I've already written that thing. And William, I, I actually have a, a bunch of thoughts because I, I just finished your novel a few days ago. And then um, the, the part you picked making me think of um those scenes make feel like uh film scenes from you know in, in the novel you talk a lot about the porn industry um and uh actually you know i kept wondering i was like are there any other famous fisters or who are, who are the famous fisters out there who is the famous fisting going on well Perhaps the most famous person associated with the practice is Michel Foucault, uh, who's, who's um, the epigraph, what, what it was, epigram or epigraph of the uh, first novel is from Michel Foucault. Uh, and yeah, I, I think... Uh, there's there isn't a long body of work associated with fisting, which is one of the reasons why I wrote about it for the novels, because I felt as though it was a way of having some territory in the literary firmament, firmament all to myself. Uh, <clears throat> Severo Sardui talks about fisting a little uh, in, uh, I think it's in Maitreya, but the prose is so baroque that it's difficult actually to tell what he's writing about and um you know often when people write about fisting they do it while they're clutching their pearls and and i thought you know that's i'm not interested in reinforcing that i um i thought i'd do it in a way that was fairly dispassionate and 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 an accurate description uh, you know, the other figure who's associated with fisting in film is is Fred Halstead, uh, and it's an an important uh, he's he, he's an important figure in the history of porn. He made a, a film called uh, "L.A. Plays Itself" that has recently been restored and released on Blu-ray and DVD. Um, and I wrote a biography of him called Halstead Plays Himself, which was published by Semio Text in 2011. So I guess all of this is, you know, related. It's a bit like Derek. I have a limited number of obsessions and they appear over and over in the, uh, in the body of work. I had never even heard of fisting till I met William. How is that possible? I'm a lie. I'm just lying. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really. <laughs> yeah, I've had a team of surgeons up my ass. I, I know. I know about it. But that's not the way they got access to your entrails. Didn't they no, just only, open only, you up? Yeah, a couple of times they had to go the other way, but um, the government paid for it because I'm in Canada. That's great. <laughs> there was I, a lot I, about uh, Detroit in your book. Actually, there was a lot about different cities all over the world. I mean, the last quarter of the novel, a lot of it takes place in Berlin. Um, and it explores all sorts of different ideas about the cities, but also kind of how these cities create their own unique fisting scene or scenes in general. 
Yeah. <laughs> well, well, one thing I should say, um, the, 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 the presence of Detroit in the book has a couple of functions. And one uh, is that while I was writing the trilogy, I lost a really great friend, uh, a man named Bernie Yenna Lewis, who had a whole circle of friends who adored him. Uh, and he died of ALS a couple of years ago uh, and did not live to to read the entire trilogy. In fact, I think he only lived long enough to read the first novel. So in the second novel, I introduced him as a character and I gave him the name Bernie. Uh, and, and so it was really a very direct tribute to him. I changed some things about him. Uh, for instance, I gave him the ability to drive, which apparently upset some of his friends because he couldn't drive uh and he lived in new york city but um bernie was from the detroit area and this was an obsession of his every i i got these amazing emails from him that uh were about his visiting detroit after he had left and uh, a lot of that material ended up in the book verbatim because I thought, why not? <laughs> um, you know, a shocking amount of my novels actually have their point of origin uh, in texts and emails that I either send or that are sent to me. Um, so, yeah, that vast chunks of, of his correspondence ended up in the in the book somewhat less than in the first draft someone did say uh, all this stuff about detroit is too digressive you got to cut it back and i did so but it's another way for the narrator to deal with his hometown in a sense because you do know that uh from the book that the narrator the, the, his birthplace is not named uh but you do know that the narrator comes from the industrial midwest and uh, he does visit his hometown from time to time but this is a way of providing just a bit more context about what that meant to be um, from a place that experienced very serious hard times. Uh, and the narrator's solution to that was to escape and go to, to California. Uh, but obviously not everyone can do that. Um, and then Berlin, well, I wrote a Los Angeles trilogy and how do I how do I bring the damn thing to an end? Well, I have him leave town. The narrator leaves town. And where does he go? He goes to Berlin, where, as it happens, there's quite a lot of fisting going on. So that's kind of appropriate. But I don't want to discuss all the I mean, that's already enough of a fucking spoiler. I'm not going <laughs> to give you any more information about it, um, except to say one of the big narrative turns is that the the, the narrator becomes a painter, um, which I have done, uh, which is a, a way of getting a transition to the next part of the program. I guess uh, the, uh, we're gonna we're gonna explore the bathos of a slide lecture, like art history class. And I'll show you some of the paintings I've been making. As a friend of mine put it. I wrote a future for myself and that future came true. Uh, the narrator of the trilogy becomes a painter. Uh, and so did I. <laughs> um, well, do, do we want to move forward with showing paintings or do, I think we, do we want to talk a little bit more about the, do we have questions in the chat or do, do any, does anybody want to ask anything specifically? Um, I can show some paintings, and if people have questions, we can answer them at the very end. How's okay. that? Yeah, that sounds good. Um, let me figure out how to do this. Yeah, share the screen. Is that sharing? Yeah. Okay, let's see. Hold on. So this is the first painting I made, <clears throat> not literally, but um, I, I was always using, I was trying acrylics before and I hated them. They looked like pieces of plastic. And then my friend, Angela Dufresne, uh, she, I was visiting her and she said, 
uh, try oils here. Here are some oil paints and some canvases and brushes. Try try some oil paints. And I did, and I immediately liked them. Uh, I felt as though I, she, the way she put it was they're, they're nice and squishy, like bodily fluids. Uh, and that was a very convincing argument for me. So I, um, I started making oils. And my first painting is of a butthole, uh, which you see here. And I did that in August of last year. 2022. So I've been a painter for only a little bit over a year. Um, so next slide. All right, I, I guess they're not slides, they're digital images. Sorry, I'm an old fashioned guy. Um, so this is called Man in Collar. And this is the first painting I made that I actually liked. And I made it almost exactly a year ago in October of 2022. Uh, and I'm happy to say that it actually sold uh, to a Canadian. Congratulations. So, uh, yeah, that that uh, that was a great breakthrough. I didn't know how I painted it, and because I hadn't documented the process. So I, by trial and error over the next, few weeks after that i i tried to make another painting that looked like this painting and i finally succeeded in doing something like that um but this was you know one of those happy accidents that happened there's a little hand icon over one over the painting is there a way of getting rid of that tim or is that just something that's embedded in the image i didn't put is it, it there. is it gone now no oh really i don't see yeah. it on my end I well, you're just gonna have little. You're gonna have little hands over the painting. Sorry. Next. Is it still there? Yeah. Oh, really? I don't <laughs> see that right. So strange, huh? Just imagine the hand isn't there. Okay. Oh, good. You don't see any hands. Well, I do. Okay, good. I've got. I don't one. see it either, William. No hands. Okay. So I'm psychotic. I had the cursor over my own paintings, and that is the panic I had. I'm so sorry. So this is a painting of Escarita. And Escarita was Little Richard's best friend. And he taught Little Richard how to play piano. But from this painting, sometimes people mistake him for Little Richard. It isn't actually him. Little Richard actually taught Escarita how to do his hair. Um, and Escarita is a really remarkable colorful figure from the history of rock and roll and did um, a number of recordings that have been commercially released from time to time. And he died of AIDS in 1986. Uh, and I showed this painting partly because, you know, I, he's an amazing figure to talk about, but also because uh, my, my body of work has a bunch of different iconographic uh, groups in it. And one of them is historical figures. And they're generally historical figures that uh, I, th I think are perhaps not as well known as I would like them to be. Next. Oh, yes. Well, this is another early painting of mine that I was very pleased with. Um, and so a lot of my paintings come from images that I get from uh, social media, particularly from Twitter which is now called X, uh, but also from Instagram. And uh, this is another painting that was purchased. Uh, and the person who bought it posted it on Instagram. And um, it was immediately commented. He had many, he has many followers. So it was immediately commented on. And one of the first comments with of the image was, that's me. Um, and I did a little research and I realized that actually this, the, the person in this painting getting the foot in his mouth uh, is someone named Zach Stefanos, who has a, an Instagram account. And uh, I, it has, he has many, many posts and I didn't have the patience to look for this specific image in his Instagram, but I'll take his word for it. Uh, and so, you know, that's, <laughs> that happened almost immediately uh, after the thing was posted on social media. One of the reasons that I think I'm going to be retiring from social media at some point in the near future. Uh, but I think I'll post a few paintings before I do that. Next. 
Oh, yeah. So, you know, one of the great figures I adore is Francis Bacon. Uh, and this is Francis Bacon in drag. Uh, Francis Bacon, many of his paintings are based upon photographs by an amazing photographer named John Deacon. Uh, and you see these images from time to time. Sometimes it, they look like they've been trampled on and, and painted on. Uh, and John Deacon took this picture. And for many years in the John Deacon es estate, it was unidentified. The subject was unidentified. And it was simply called, I think, unidentified woman or unidentified sitter. And only a couple of years ago, it was discovered that, or they figured it out that, that, that this is actually Francis Bacon in drag. He made a rather dumpy looking woman. Um, oh, somebody asked how large the paintings are. Uh, this painting is 12 inches by 16 inches. And uh, most of the paintings I make are small. Some of them are eight by 10 inches, and I can alert you to those when they come up. But most of them, I believe that you're going to be seeing are 12 by 16 inches. Uh, and I can actually hold up something that is that size and show you how big that is. This is a 12 by 16 inch canvas. For those of you who are in metric world and aren't aware of what it, you know, 12 by 16 inches is, that's how big the canvas you're looking at is. Uh, if you can see me in the screen at the same time, perhaps you can't. And this is like the phantom, phantom hand on the painting. Only I can see it. So sorry about that if, if, that's, the, if that's the case. Next slide. Uh, yeah, this is another example of something I got from social media. And I've actually seen more than one painter make versions of this. Uh, so that's kind of embarrassing. But uh, this is this is something that that uh, I think got a lot of attention when I first exhibited it, uh, which was uh, not that long ago. It was in Freeze, New York, uh, in May. Uh, but it's it's another example of something I've gotten from social media and made into a painting. All right, next. Okay, here's another historical figure. This was just on view uh, in David Kordansky Gallery's 20th anniversary show, which closed, I think, in August. Uh, so it's very recent. And um, this is Maurice Blanchot, the famous theoretician and novelist. Uh, and Blanchot himself rarely went out in the sun. I think this is important as a documentation of one of the few times he went to the beach. You'll notice he's formally dressed. He's got a, a suit on. He's all bundled up. Uh, I don't know what season it was taken in, but from a snapshot. And, uh, and I found that on Instagram as well. A friend has brought to my attention that he looks a bit like Marilyn Manson in, uh, in this picture. So um, you can think about that as well. Maybe this is a Marilyn Manson version of Maurice Blanchot. Uh, next. <clears throat> well, this is a man pissing in another man's mouth. Uh, I found it on Twitter, not on Instagram, because Zuckerberg chooses to suppress such images, as delightful as they are. Uh, and this is a, another painting of mine that sold very early on um, to a collector in Los Angeles, actually. And uh, the original photograph is uh, two men with a stream of piss, of course. And uh, the surface that they are on is actually AstroTurf, which accounts for the strange, unnaturalistic color of the background. Um, Strangely enough, I showed this painting somewhat reluctantly to a painter friend of mine. I will not name who this person is. I, someone who is fairly preposterous. Uh, I'll, put, I'll use that word to describe this person. Anyway, I showed this painting and uh, the painter said, is that a painting of a flower? But I trust that some of you can see what the true subject is. 
uh, next next painting. Uh, a number of the other paintings I do are of sports figures in embarrassing moments on the field. I have a particular fondness for rugby. Uh, if you haven't watched rugby, you really should because it's an amazing thing to see. Um, and this is called Getting Dacked. No, it is, I think it's just called Dacked. D-A-C-K-E-D. Uh, and getting dacked is a an Australian slang expression originating with rugby. Uh, what 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 happens in rugby is you're allowed to tackle a player by grabbing his uniform, and this leads to some uh, costume malfunctions, uh, specifically guys' asses pulling popping out on the field. Uh, so anyway, when somebody pulls down your your shorts. It's called getting dacked, which um, I think is it's delightful that there's an expression for this. But yeah, that's a player getting dacked. And this is, oh, this is the first one we've seen, which is eight by 10 inches. So it's a very small one. Okay, next. Um, so I not only use images from uh, social media and images from sporting events and images of historical figures, I also use images of friends. Uh, and I've been very fortunate because some of my friends are exhibitionists and they send me all kinds of pictures and videos and some of them get made into paintings. And this, the man who's facing the camera in the original picture is uh, named Sean Crum. And he's from Youngstown, Ohio, the region where this event originates from. Uh, he's a painter, and uh, he has had many exhibitions in the Youngstown area. Uh, and he's a good friend of mine. And he sends many, many pictures. So I, I consider him my muse. Uh, and here he is kneeling in front of his boyfriend, who's at the right of the picture, although you don't really see his face. But yeah, hi, Sean. <clears throat> Next. And this is another image of my dear friend. Uh, that's that's Sean. <laughs> he, he doesn't really have any boundaries about what he sends me. And for this, I'm very, very thankful. It's a little fuzzy, this image. I'm, I apologize. I didn't realize that uh, the, the image was so, lo so low res. Um, please forgive me. Okay, next. Uh, yeah, this is another fairly low res image uh, of uh, a painting I call Athletic Shoes. And uh, it's only eight by 10 inches. And it's quite detailed in the rendering of the athletic shoes. I felt almost like a Flemish painter or something um, doing these to the bottoms of these shoes. Next. And this is, uh, okay, here's an example of a couple of paintings that I did on the same day. I paint very quickly and um, I try to get a painting done in a, a, a window of about six hours time. And uh, this one was done uh, on the same day as the following painting. This is uh, also a uh, Twitter image and it's a man who has a, an account on only, only fans. And this Twitter account is a kind of come on to his OnlyFans account. Um, some people have recognized this image from the painting, uh, presumably because they follow this guy or they belong to his OnlyFans account uh, and pay for to see him flaunt his unbelievably large penis in various uh, settings for you know whoever pays. Uh, then this guy's from Brazil, and he's swimming underwater in this painting. Okay, next. And this is an 8 by 10 painting. The previous painting is 12 by 16, and this one's 8 by 10. And it was actually done on the same day as the previous painting. Uh, and one of the ways you can tell that I, I have make uh, two paintings in the same day is that they tend to have similar color palettes. I have a bunch of colors on my palette, which is actually right behind me. 
I use that that glass top table as my palette. And, um, you know, if I have a whole lot of paint on the palette and I have enough energy, sometimes I'll make a second painting in a day. Uh, and this is an example of, of that happening. Next, please. <clears throat> Uh, this is another social media find. And, uh, you know, some of the most interesting images are people who have a fetishistic relationship to sexuality. Uh, this is a sneaker fetish painting. Um, and I'm, I'm also very fond of flip phones. Uh, and he's got a, he's got a flip phone in his hand. Whether this is an old image or he his flip phone is a fashion statement, I cannot tell you. But um, I'm very happy to have included a flip phone in one of my paintings. I, I do, this is the one example of it you'll see today, but um, there are a number of paintings I've done where cell phones are in, in the frame. Uh, and it's it's very much part of uh, the context, people um, who have certain exhibitionistic tendencies, they they have sex and there are a bunch of cell phones around. Um, and that's a very, I think it's a very modern thing. Um, you wouldn't necessarily have seen that in another century. So I feel like, you know, that's one way that this very old fashioned practice of making oil paintings can be uh, can be modern or contemporary. Next. So sometimes I paint celebrities and sometimes I paint women. I didn't want to give you the impression that I only paint men. Uh, and this is a portrait of Lana Del Rey, in case you don't know who this is. Uh, and the original was in black and white. <clears throat> and I made up my own color palette for it, which is something I very much like to do. It's the case with the Francis Bacon portrait as well. Uh, I like working from black and white pictures and then giving them my own color palette. Uh, so, you know, I have some creative work to do too. Anyway, in case you wondered, I'm not the biggest Lana Del Rey fan in the world. I just love the picture um, where she seems to be kind of channeling Sharon Tate. It's a very retro looking image. Next. Uh, okay, so Lana Del Rey and this painting came from the period when I was at McDowell. I did a residency at a place called McDowell in New Hampshire, and I imposed a discipline on myself to make a painting a day. And there was nothing else to do there, so I might as well. Uh, and so I, I made a huge number of paintings, somewhat to my gallery's chagrin, because we had to figure out a way to get them from New Hampshire to a storage space in Long Island City. Um, and we solved that problem. But I made, I made 28 paintings while I was in residence at McDowell. And this is one of my favorites from that period. Uh, and he's not talking on a flip phone. He is talking on a regular uh, smartphone of the present era. But this is a somewhat famous or notorious video on social media. Uh, he's actually have a having a conversation with his girlfriend right before he sucks a dick, which is, um, it's also a very modern thing. Oh, also this is a somewhat atypical uh, frame. Um, it, the, this painting is 12 inches across by 20 inches vertically and, um, I had a few canvases specially fabricated because uh, this 12 by 20, which uh, is essentially five to three, is the aspect ratio of a smartphone screen. Uh, and is also, I think, the aspect ratio of a flat screen monitor. Uh, and I've, I've had a number of canvases fabricated at that size and we'll probably have a few more done uh, because I like, I like these nice oblong canvases. Next. Uh, this is an eight by 10, and uh, it is a portrait of Luis Buñuel, who I consider to be one of the greatest artists in any medium. 
Uh, and this was painted near the end of my time at McDowell. Uh, it's only an eight by 10 and uh, I got it done fairly quickly. Uh, I should also mention this is from the beginning of the film, uh, As Chien Andalou, which I suspect some of you have seen. Uh, and it's right before he, he Buñuel himself slashes the eyeball, which is a, you know, one of the most famous scenes in cinema. Uh, and of course, because that's a black and white film, I have made up the color palette myself. Um, and that's something I'm very happy to do. Um, this sort of mid vibrant magenta is one of my favorite colors to use as a background for a painting. I also like various shades of green, uh, as you've noticed in some of the other paintings, because I think those colors uh, set off flesh tones quite well. Okay, next. So most of the blurring I do on the paintings is horizontal, which kind of gives them the appearance of an old video, like a VHS tape that's been paused, which is an effect I love because I come from the era of the VHS tape and uh, a lot of my visual inspirations come from old tapes that I've been pausing. Uh, or I, I did pause, I don't have a VHS stick anymore, I confess. Anyway, most of the blurring that takes place on these paintings is horizontal, uh, even if the canvas is, is vertically oriented. And in this case, I painted a gray background for the painting and I didn't want the gray to make all of the flesh tones in the composition go dead because it has the potential really to deaden things. You have this kind of bluish gray with flesh tones. So I, I, I blurred this vertically um, somewhat atypically, although I, I have a bunch of paintings I've, I've, I've gone over vertically with a, a brush at the very last minute. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, I think it's a porno image, but it's not explicit. It's rather sweet. Next. This is probably my favorite painting I have made to date. It's a painting I really am fond of, and it is of Friedrich Nietzsche. Uh, an artist visited him in the last year of his life and made some pictures, and he made paintings based on those pictures. Uh, I did not base my painting upon his paintings, but upon the photographs he made. Um, as I think some of you already know, uh, Nietzsche published his last book in 1888, and in 1889, early in the year, he had a mental breakdown in Turin. And um, he, after this, he was put in a mental hospital uh, and he never emerged from um, mental hospitals. Uh, and he became essentially catatonic and uh, he never really emerged from that state either. He lived until 1900. Uh, and this photograph that this is based upon was taken the year before he died in 1899 and um yeah I, I i'm really fond of this painting partly because of the color palette um which i was criticized for by someone who's a huge nietzsche fan she told me um his eyes were not blue um and I, I have to say, I'd like to take liberties from time to time with the color. I'm sure that the walls of the asylum were not purple either. Uh, and um, yeah, I'm afraid if somebody texts me and says, his eyes weren't blue, they basically don't get to see any more paintings. I, I, I can't cope with that kind of criticism, <laughs> to be honest with you. But anyway, yeah, this is one of my favorites, if not my all-time favorite. And I did it only recently. Uh, I think it's from September. It's from after I returned from McDowell. Next. Uh, okay, so this is my first still life painting. Uh, this is actually based upon another artifact in Northeast Ohio. This is, uh, I call it after Soutine. 
Uh, and this is based upon a painting called Still Life with Ray Fish. Uh, the object ex suspended over the kettle and the pomegranates at the bottom of the frame, the object suspended over them is, is uh, a stingray that has been disemboweled uh, in the original painting. Uh, and if you don't know Chaim Soutine's work, please look it up. He's an absolutely incredible painter. Uh, I will I will put his name in the chat, perhaps. Anyway, uh, so this is a painting I saw in the Cleveland Museum of Art from the time I was a child, and I thought it was fascinating. So I thought it was somehow appropriate that the first still life I paint is uh, based upon, uh, it's after uh, Soutine, this amazing painting that um, is currently, actually, it's not on view in Cleveland right now. It's on tour. It's in Dusseldorf at the moment. Um, and I actually considered going to Dusseldorf just to see this new exhibition of Chaim Soutine. But for the moment, I'm going to satisfy myself with just getting the catalog. Uh, but I, you know, he's one of my favorite painters, along with Francis Bacon. Uh, they're two of my favorite modern painters who I look at all the time. And this is actually fairly large. This is, for me, quite large. I think it's uh, 16 inches by 20 inches. Uh, and one of, one of the largest paintings I've made. Next. Another vertical blur. Um, I guess I got in the habit of doing it for a while. And this is a, from a, um, a social media find. And uh, the, the color palette, I think, is particularly wacky, uh, particularly the armpit hair. The armpit on the right, the hair looks almost like the maple leaf on the Canadian flag which I find somewhat amusing. Uh, next. This is another of my favorites. Um, this is only an eight by 10 inch painting. It's called Man, Man in Leather Mask. Uh, and I like it. One reason I like it is that it's it seems to embody the modern printing color profile, CMYK. There's uh, cyan, magenta, yellow, and black, all in this one painting. That's the color scheme. Um, and I like the way it blurred. And I believe the next painting is the last. Yes. So in honor of Halloween, I do a painting of... Uh, Helen Chandler and Bela Lugosi in a from a still from the movie Dracula in 1931, uh, which is you know a wonderful film. And uh, yeah, it's the last painting in the group. So yeah, thank you for bearing with my um, my what slide talk. It's almost like a conventional artist's talk. Uh, and it may not be what you expected because you thought this was going to be a reading all from beginning to end. But, uh, you know, here are some paintings to look at. Uh, so <laughs> any, any, any questions? Someone just said, fist me like Helen Chandler. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> She, I do not believe she was deaf and uh, and blind. In she, she was she, she she could see and speak and hear in in the movie Dracula. But she was one of Dracula's victims. I'm looking through the chat right now. Oh, it's so funny, William. We've been watching the Rugby World Cup. It just ended last night. Who won? Um, South Africa won by one point. Who did they beat? The All Blacks, New Zealand. Okay. Yeah, Australia and New Zealand and the South Sea Islands tend to have some of the best teams, best national teams. Um, 
and a lot of my images come from those those teams. Um, well, thank you for sharing those with us. How are you feeling becoming an uh, painter? <laughs> Is it something you ever <laughs> thought you were going to do? Well, I did go to art school. <laughs> um, so it's not an entire surprise. Uh, and, but the only big surprise is that it, this happened so late in life. Um, but yeah, I, I, you know, I thought that people would be shocked. And I don't think people are quite as shocked as I expected. Because I think there's a continuity between what I'm painting and the way I paint and um, the artistic works I've done in the past, which are mainly films, uh, but also collages. Yeah. And, and, you know, I wrote it. I, I The narr first person narrator of the trilogy becomes a painter. And uh, I guess that laid the groundwork for me to actually do it. Um, I will say the timing was exact. Uh, I finished writing the third novel and almost immediately afterwards started painting. That's very, it was a very efficient process. And how's the reception been so far? You said that you were at Freeze just a few months ago, right? Um, I mean, so far, it's been very nice. Um, everyone's everyone's quite happy, and um, that's you know that's not trivial. But um, also, the gallery, David Kordansky Gallery, is going to be giving me a show soon. Uh, July of next year in Los Angeles. They now have galleries in New York and Los Angeles. I had a show uh, a little over a year ago in the New York space uh, of my films. And it was a kind of survey exhibition of, of a lot of different films. Uh, and uh, next year in July, they're going to have uh, a show of my paintings in the Los Angeles space. So um, yeah, I'm working towards that. Uh, looks like we have a question. <clears throat> How do you arrange your paintings? I'm assuming like in a gallery space is what they're asking. Um, thus far, it, it they've they've only been a handful shown, and so they've just been shown framed in a line. But um, I anticipate by the time I mean I work quickly. I've made a lot of paintings, so. Uh, I anticipate by the time the show happens in Los Angeles, there'll be a large group of them and they'll be hung a little bit more like salon style, uh, which I like because you can actually see the entirety of what I'm interested in, in terms of iconography. Uh, it's, it's not just a porno show or a show of celebrities or historical figures or photographs of my friends that became paintings it's everything all at once uh and i that the effect of that is something i'm really looking forward to seeing and how many paintings have you made so far maybe you maybe you already said that but <laughs> no i didn't um i've been very busy uh i think the total is now 160 so i've made a few and you know it they're small and i work quickly so i don't feel as though i'm i'm gambling much if i make experiments uh and i have actually destroyed a few paintings because they didn't please me um but yeah i've 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 made 160 paintings since last august i want to ask both of you actually because I, I i know derek i know that you do some um some visual work as well. And how, how do you feel about that process versus the, the writing process? Um, oh, my visual work has mostly been getting like super talented people to help me. That's, <laughs> I, I, I like the, the whole project with the Art Gallery of York University was Ian and, and yeah, it's been collaborations, but I love collaborations. Um, I like, uh, there's a public art project going up in Toronto right now that I wrote the text for, but that was the easy part. I mean, someone had to design it and make it, my friend Mike Alexier and install it and, 
um yeah so um i, I wouldn't i wouldn't i wouldn't say i do that much yeah but i mean i'd love to art. I, I, you I am, are making your own art don't I know I'm, I'm trying but uh yeah <laughs> is someone doing a a stage adaptation of one of your books did oh someone did that um well my book the haunted hillbilly was a musical in canada that played for quite a while and then um and then recently this uh, woman uh Camissa, uh did um adapted the well-dressed balloon uh, novel of mine into a play in berlin and then they just did this table reading in new york city which i did not see i was told it was going to be a table reading but my friend who went said there were actually effects it it was a table reading that it was staged like a table reading, but was more complicated with sound effects and visuals. So it sounded great to me. Uh, I didn't get to see it. I just heard reports and pictures, but that's fine. Like there's no way I could have stayed in the room and listened to people say my words. It's just, I, it, I would be so anxious. I would ruin the night for everybody. Um, Speaking of I, ruining the night, I thought that you might show images of the art that you're working on, but you, no. you said you wouldn't. Yeah. But at least we got you to admit that you are make, making art. Well, I've been talking about it for years, but, you know, everything, I'm so slow and I talk about things for a long time before I do them, but I, I don't have 160 paintings. I'm not as disciplined as William either. Derek, what are you, what are you working on now? Uh, I wrote a little essay, of, like a fake fashion essay, and then I've been, that's what William talked about, that I've been making objects to illustrate it, and then, um, uh, but I've been really slow, like the pandemic, I just, uh, uh, I found really rough, and then I found Ambien, and now I mostly take, I have a deep relationship with Ambien, that I, uh, <laughs> I see, I see it every day, we were together every day, and every night, uh, and uh, I want to write another novel. I have a couple, like I'm almost out of ideas. So I only got a few. I got to figure out what to do next. And then I'm going to retire. Good for you. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, William, we have a question for you. Most of your paintings based on photographs, how do you choose your photo images? Is there any factor or characteristic in a photo that attracts you? Well, you know, <clears throat> My practice is very much about my iPhone. Uh, I I either take a picture or a friend texts me a picture or I, you know, steal pictures from social media. And I, I now look at my phone right now. Um, yeah, at the moment I have nearly 15,000 images on my phone and I've only owned this phone for a few months. I got a phone with one terabyte of storage in it so I could get as many images as possible. So one thing I should say is, <clears throat> for me, the process is a bit like editing. You know, I, I was trained as a filmmaker and I think about editing. I edit my my novels and I, this the editing process is extremely important to me. So from this nearly 15,000 images, I... I have, I think, 700 or no, maybe 800 favorites. So that's part of the process, like going from this vast number of images to the ones that I really think plausibly could be a painting. Um, and I really have very acutely learned about the differences between photography and painting. Um, often, what interests a person about a pain uh, about a, a, a photograph is some sort of telling detail, some sort of strange thing in the in the photograph, and it works because of the realism of the photographic medium. There's something clear that looks like it was you know photographed on a day, uh, uh, specific details. And then, and then you see something that's just weird and you think, oh, wow, I love that photograph. Mm -hmm. That photograph doesn't work for a painting for me. That works, that's only a photograph for me. And I had a very sad experience recently where I had this beautiful 19th century photograph of a dandy. And uh, 
he had this amazing hand gesture. He was like holding up a letter with his hand kind of in this position. And uh, I thought, oh, that'll make a great painting. And of course it was a total, total failure as a painting uh, because that hand gesture got lost when I blurred the painting. Uh, and so that, that was very depressing. Um, and I, you know, maybe the, the lesson is 19th century photography is not very appropriate to what I do. I should just stick to frame grabs from self-made porno videos and, you know, headshots of celebrities and my friends, you know, showing off. I don't know. But um, it is it is a very particular thing that has to be it almost always has to be a digital photograph uh, and it has to be very, very casual um, and almost non aesthetic in its appeal. Um, and I, in a way, I'm kind of capturing for the aesthetic something which is not aesthetic, something which is a throwaway or something which looks like trash. And I make it into something that's a little bit prettier. Yeah, they're beautiful. Yeah. Um, someone has a question about any new film projects on the horizon. Alas, no. Um, the the circumstances that allowed me to make films pretty much evaporated over the time of the pandemic. Um, so my last film that I completed was 2017 and I haven't been able to do a film since, um, and it's a little complicated to explain it, but basically COVID killed my filmmaking practice and, um, the novel writing kind of took over a lot of the impulses I would have put into films. I put into the novels and then the painting practice is a kind of outgrowth of the, the novels. Uh, so I guess I've kind of moved on, but I'm open to the possibility of making a film in the future. I just don't know what that film could be right now. Um, I, 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 I never say never. I'm often saying, oh, I'll never do that again. And I end up doing it. And somebody calls me on it and says, you know, in 1987, you said you would never paint. Uh, and here I am doing it. But you know, 1987 was a long time ago. So yeah, who knows what's coming. But uh, at the moment, I have no plans to make films. I think there's a question for Derek. No. Derek? Yes. Are you making jewelry? Oh, I replied to that. Okay. There's a whole jewelry uh, side conversation going on. Oh, yeah, I, 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 uh, I'm trying. Um, I would like to write a film though, William. I want to write a Christmas movie for Cary Grant. If anyone knows how I can get a hold of Cary Grant, I'd love to talk to him about it. Get out I, your Ouija board. Well, I feel with AI now it might be possible, right? Maybe. Um, I mean, not possible because I'm not, probably not going to write it and no one's going to let me do it. But um, but I think there's a chance now I can do a Christmas movie where he fucks David Niven. <laughs> Fun for the whole family. Yeah. <laughs> I gave you my idea you are away. Awesome. <laughs> what? I gave my idea away. Ah. <laughs> At least, oh, you haven't, at least you haven't spilled the beans on the title. This is a secret aspect of your personality. You're obsessed with Christmas movies. You watch them all the time. Yeah, I do all year long. And my favorite time to watch them is after Christmas when it's the most depressing and poignant. And I'm even more out of sync with the world than I usually am. But yeah, it's just about my season. Yeah. Yeah, Halloween merges right into it. And then I have them all on DVD so I can watch them all 90, 100 times in a season. Oh, someone wants to know more about if you have any more novels in you. Well, yeah. Oh, uh, uh, I have one idea that um, I either want to get through with and then see what happens or, or take my time doing because it's the last one. But uh 
I have one idea. I have like a couple ideas. I at some point I want I want to rewrite that Hams thing and do a zine of that, and uh, I want to do some more essays. And I used to want to do a magic show, um, but I don't know. I don't know. You know, I'm quite old, and I have trouble getting around or thinking or doing anything. I uh, yet you then, have an encyclopedic knowledge of the material history of crap <laughs> which you make use of in all of your writings perhaps instead of making paintings what you've been doing is reading publications that tell you things like where sequins come from and uh how to how to make pumpkins into the shape of frankenstein's head yeah i'm happy though that like I, there was a time in my life where I had so much knowledge about crap, I thought I have to write this all down. But now I like the thought of it all dying with me. Um, and I'll just be a pile <laughs> of crap. And I'll be full of the crap that I consumed. Uh, but thank you for the question about the novel. I For sure I have one in me. And it's not going to be about country music. And it's not going to be about vampires. It's going to be a very touching, heartwarming novel that's my plan is i want everyone to feel bad for me and have a cry and william how about you do you have another novel on you oh god how shall i put this um what i like to say to people is that i was a miserable writer and now i'm a happy painter <laughs> So if that's your choice, what would you choose? Uh, I do every so often get an idea. I think, oh, maybe this can be a novel. Maybe. Um, and, you know, <clears throat> the trilogy is is done. And I, I recently had the perverse idea that I might like do a kind of pendant to the trilogy, a fourth novel that happens many, many years later and somehow describes the very strange moment we're living through. Um, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is really batshit crazy. Uh, all of the political and, and environmental and, uh, I mean, is it my imagination or is virtually every political figure in the United States on drugs? I mean, some of that stuff they're doing, it must be crystal meth or, you know, prescription amphetamines. But really, what are we living through? And so, you know, there's this perverse idea I have to make the narrator come back from being an emigre and like actually see what the United States is like, almost like a Rip Van Winkle story, because what, what he's going to encounter is totally appalling. Uh, and, you know, that could be kind of interesting, but uh, I don't feel any like I'm in a rush to write it because I feel as though the moment is still with us. Uh, you know, I think in a way the moment has to be over before I can actually write anything about it. Yeah. I'm sorry to say, I, I wish I could intervene somehow with art in this moment and and make things less insane and horrible. But but I think this is actually one of the unfortunate aspects of being an artist in the present, mm -hmm. that there doesn't seem to be a way for us to intervene and make everything a little bit better. Uh, the bombardments are not going to stop and the um, incompetent lawyers are not going to get any better or worse. And uh, I mean, you know, you you just look at the news and it's like it's 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 kind of incredible if someone had told me as a young adult oh by the way this is going to be in the future i would never have believed it it's also strange also horrific uh, the good stuff is strange the terrible stuff is horrific so i don't know maybe there's another novel in me but i'm not in any rush to write it i'm i'm happy as a painter right now well um that was a long answer. Sorry about that. <laughs> I feel like we've uh, gone quite a bit longer than we uh, had initially intended. Well, you know, it would be nice to, to end on a, a note of hope rather than what I've just unloaded on you. So please ask another lovely question and have Derek save the day. I am very cheery. Yes. 
Somebody is asking about Derek. Have you have you ever? Okay, wait. Uh, Guy Madden. When is he going to make Castle Faggot in a movie? I think that's that's the main just the question. <laughs> ah, okay. Uh, Seth asked that. Okay. Um, please ask Guy when you see him. Uh. <laughs> I have a secret history with Guy Madden. Um, my best friend in the world, Jason McBride, edited his journals for Coach House. And that was some time ago. Anyway, that year as a gift for Jason, Guy and I made a Christmas short, um, which only Jason has a copy of, which has never been screened or seen. But we had a blast making it. We took a day. Uh, we borrowed a house. Uh, we got he got this catnip Santa and we the house cats that were there we got them stoned and happy and falling on gingerbread houses and he filmed it all um I think the title of the short is the ecstatic of oh, the ecstatic something of catnip Santa the ecstatic death of catnip Santa anyway it'll never be seen but um <laughs> yes I love guy and I admire guy and I see him around uh once in a while not so much during the pandemic but um I would be honored, of course, if he did anything. If he, he, I'm happy when he tips his hat to me or says good morning. So, <laughs> easy. let's only hope that can happen. That'd be yeah. incredible. <laughs> He's great. Okay, well, um, I think we should leave it off there. That's thank the you so note. much. Yes, William, Derek, thank you so much. This is this is a lot of fun. And thank, thank you, you for having us. us. Yeah. I'm, yeah, I would look forward to seeing what you guys are up to in the future here. Thank you um, so much. Thank you, everybody. Happy yeah. Halloween. Yeah, happy yeah. Halloween. Halloween. Thank, thank you, everyone, for attending. Merry Christmas. <laughs> All right. Um, well, this is this has been recorded, so um, so we'll send it out. Um, hopefully, it doesn't like incriminate anybody or. Anything like that. Um, thank you again for attending and uh, happy Halloween. <gasps> Bye, everyone. <laughs>